to start let me introduce you first so uh, hi everyone uh, today we are meeting as an at an unusual time because we have speaker from uk and i mean we have to do these adjustments so that it's comfortable for everyone uh, so uh, slides are already up on the web page so if at all you want to go back while uh, we have the speaker speaking you can uh, visit from there we'll also put it here in the chat box if you have any queries during the talk you can unpause unmute yourself and ask the speaker directly and so today we have marsen roshna from university of oxford and he'll be talking on understanding homomorphism approximation problems using topology over to you marsen okay thank you for the introduction and thanks a lot for for the invitation uh, i think it's a very nice opportunity because i'm um, um, I come from computer science, so my background is in algorithmics and so on, but uh, somehow my work is, is uh, exactly at this intersection of combinatorics and, and topology, uh, a lot of my work. Uh, so, so I think that there's, there's quite a few interesting things to show. Uh, so, so I will talk a little bit about the algorithmic part, but I'll try to keep it as, as short as possible, uh, just, to, just to give you some motivations. And just to keep everybody on the same page, I'll, I'll define graph coloring. So graph coloring, we have a graph, so a bunch of vertices and edges in between them. We want to map vertices to colors, say so one, two, three, four, five, such that adjacent vertices get different colors. And we like to use as few colors as possible. Uh, so you can ask this as, a, as an algorithmic problem, how, how few colors can we use? Can you solve that problem in polynomial time? And uh, as you might know, this problem is very, very hard. It's very hard to answer. Um, and the problem is a graph free colorable is just as hard as much more general problems. So we don't expect there to be any, any nice polynomial time algorithm. Uh, so we're kind of looking at, a, at an approximation version or a promise version of graph coloring. Uh, and there's actually two ways to phrase it, uh, which are not quite equivalent, but uh, that's not a big difference. So one version is the search version. The question is given a free colorable graph, can you find at least a one-handed coloring? So you know it has a free coloring. Uh, you're not given a free coloring. You just know it has one. You are promised it has one. And can you then construct uh, a one-handed coloring somehow? So it's much weaker. Uh, we are asking for something much weaker than what we are promised exists. But maybe, maybe that makes the problem more tractable. And uh, there's a very similar question. That's the decision version. Uh, it's to distinguish free colorable graphs from those that are not even 100 colorable, for example. Um, so there we have, we, we want an algorithm that distinguish those two kinds of graphs. And, and there are also graphs in between that are not free colorable, but are 100 free colorable. So for those graphs in between, the, the algorithm could output anything. We like don't care about those graphs at all. Uh, we just want to distinguish those graphs that should be quite far apart structurally. Uh, so maybe that would be easier. So we're looking at this kind of questions uh, in, in algorithmics, um, and we know very little about them. So just very shortly, what we know about them, uh, if, for example, if we focus on, on the promise that the graph is free colorable, then what we can do in polynomial time is we can find a coloring that uses square root n or fifth root of n uh, colors. So, so that's a lot, a lot of colors. Uh, it's, it's better than the trivial coloring, but uh, not much better. Uh, so that's the best we know uh, we can do in polynomial time. And on the other hand, well, what we know from lower bounds, the only thing we really know is that three versus five coloring is NP hard. So, so there's a huge gap. We, for three versus six, we already don't know uh, what's the status. So three versus six is, is, is very open, um, as is any other constant larger than six and any function between, between constant and uh, fifth root of n. So there's a huge, huge gap in what we know. Uh, but we usually conjecture that all those things are, are hard, that uh, at least for constants, uh, if you ask about C versus C prime coloring, then we believe it should be NP hard. We don't have too much, um, too good arguments for that. Like the best one we have is that we know it is true. We can prove this assuming a variant of the so-called unique games conjecture. So, so that's a popular conjecture in computer science, um, but it's not quite believed to be true uh, by everyone. 
And even then, uh, it's only assuming a, a variant of this that, that we could prove the, uh, this conjecture about C versus C prime coloring. So, so the status is very, very much open. We, we don't know much about it. And today in this talk, I want to I present how uh, topological DS and some ideas from maybe category theory can help uh, in this problem in quite, I think, quite a magical way. And more generally, with the motivation for studying this kind of problems, well, it's it's uh, obviously to solve similar problems. So solving sub problems where you have to satisfy some kinds of discrete constraints. We'd like to understand those problems as, as much as possible, approximating those problems. Uh, more generally, we'd like to understand um, what, what kind of approximation is possible, so hardness of approximation. And, and this field of computer science is related to a lot of fields of mathematics. Uh, so for example, the idea of codes, so encoding a thing so that it's robust to noise, so that uh, even, even when you add some noise to the code, then you can decode it in some way. That's very closely related to, to hardness of approximation, but it's also very much connected to other areas of mathematics. So, so it's a nice connected part uh, to, to many areas in mathematics. Uh, so that's, that's the motivation for studying those kinds of problems. And for the same motivations, uh, really, uh, the same motivations apply to a more general problem, uh, where instead of coloring, we look at uh, graph homomorphisms. So just to recall, a homomorphism is a function from vertices of G to vertices of H, such that edges are mapped to edges. So you can visualize it like uh, a homomorphism from this graph G to this graph C5. You can visualize it this way as on the right, that uh, it's kind of immersing one graph inside another. So edges have to be mapped to edges. Or you can think of, of it another way, that uh, the vertices of H are, are the colors. So you want to assign to every vertex of G one of the colors, and you have some rule that uh, the colors that are adjacent are allowed. Those colors are allowed to be adjacent. And the question is, can you find a coloring that respects these, these rules? And that's an example here of a, of a homomorphism from G to the five cycle C5. Right, and this generalizes uh, colorings because if you look at the complete graph K5, um, so this graph has all edges between different colors, but it doesn't have loops. It doesn't have an edge from uh, a color to itself. So if you want to have a homomorphism to K5, it's the same as, as a five coloring because it's the same as assigning colors one to five, such that adjacent colorings are, are different. Right, so, so a homomorphism to a complete graph is the same as a coloring, and more generally a homomorphism is just a map from vertices to vertices, such that edges are mapped to edges. Uh, so this allows you to express uh, interesting kinds of, of constraints, um, many different kinds of constraints. So, so it's more general than graph coloring, a very classical problem, and, and it's more expressive and, and somehow nicer to work with uh, for many reasons. And just some notation, I will write uh, G R O H, just if there exists any homomorphism from G to H. And I also, for the, for the same, I will say that G is H colorable. So in particular, for the complete graph, we have that the graph G admits a homomorphism to KK, to the click, uh, to the complete graph on K vertices, if and only if G is K colorable. Okay, and for, for this definition, we have really, really the same problems. We can fix now two graphs, G and H. Uh, and now we can ask, given an input graph X, uh, which is promised to be G colorable, can you at least find something much weaker, an H coloring? Or another version, can you distinguish H colorable graphs from those that are not even G colorable? So that's the algorithmic problem I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, but uh, as you'll see, um, you don't need to know much about the algorithmics to, to understand uh, how to prove things about this problem. So just a last slide about like the computer science of it. Uh, so uh, what we conjecture to be true is that this problem of G versus H coloring is pretty much always empty hard. There are some cases that are trivially solvable in polynomial time, namely when G or H is too colorable, or in other words, if one of those two graphs is, is bipartite, then it's easy to find the bipartition and it's easy to find those colorings. 
but otherwise we conjecture that uh, G versus H coloring is empty hot uh, for, for all other class G and H. And this conjecture is, is, is quite interesting because it uh, generalizes this classical conjecture that uh, C versus C prime coloring is empty hot. So it generalizes that, but it also generalizes some other results about graph homomorphisms uh, and algorithmics. Uh, so it's quite a general uh, conjecture. It, it states quite a lot, but on the other hand, it, the statement simplifies quite a lot. So if, if you think about it for a while, it's, it's not hard to see that um, really you only have to ask about coloring, about this question when G is a cycle, an odd cycle, so C to K plus one, and H is a clique. And that's because every graph can, every graph that's non-trivial, every non bipartite graph contains some odd cycle and every graph is contained in some clique. So if you use the statements, it's, it's pretty easy to show that uh, uh, to study this conjecture, all you have to consider is those very simple graphs, the, the odd cycles and the complete graphs Kn. Okay, so, so what we will want to study is homomorphism into uh, of cycles versus homomorphism into clicks, so just basic classical colorings. Um, and the results I want to talk about today uh, are that uh, we can solve kind of half of this conjecture. Uh, we can prove that uh, G versus K3 is np hot for all three colorable graphs. And when we use topology for that, interestingly, and Moreover, we can show that in some sense, topology seems to be necessary. So uh, we can argue that this property that we proved for K3, the property that for all graphs G, G versus uh, H is NP hot, this property only depends on, on the topology of H. So to every graph H, we will assign some kind of topological space. And it turns out that this property, which is just a combinatorial, very algorithmic even property, uh, somehow it, it doesn't depend on, on how the graph exactly looks like. It, it only depends on like the homotopy type of, of a space associated with H. So that's the, that's the algorithmic part of it. Uh, but let's try, to, let's try to understand why H coloring is hard as an algorithmic problem. Um, so I try to, to present this in a way that you know, doesn't, doesn't assume any knowledge of computer science. So the way we prove that some problem is hard is that uh, we build an instance of the problem that encodes another more general problem that we know that we assume is hard. So, so all this is about encoding some, some kind of choices, some constraints uh, using those that we have available. And the crucial gadget here um, is uh, just the power of H, H to the N, which is just a tensor product H times H times H or it's the same as the categorical product, if you prefer. Um, and now, if you look at this gadget um, as an instance and you try to age color it, uh, then one way of, age, uh, of coloring it, uh, of mapping it homomorphically into age, is just a projection. Uh, so for every coordinate i uh, from 1 to n, we have this map from h n to h. Kind of by, by definition of the product, there, there's this very simple map that uh, just to a tuple x, y, z always outputs x, for example. So we always have those h colorings, but uh, as it turns out, for quite many graphs h, these are essentially the only uh, h colorings of, of this gadget. So it's, it's not quite true in general. For example, if h has automorphisms, you can compose with those automorphisms. But that's kind of the idea that. Um, Essentially, the, the, the only H colorings are, are, are those projections. And then that means that if, if you're asked to H color the gadget H to the N, then it's the same as choosing one of those projections. So it's the same as choosing uh, just an integer between one and N. Uh, so this will be a gadget that encodes a choice of one and N. And the way it's encoded, it's kind of robust to noise, and it's kind of easy to, to, to show constraints between, to construct constraints between two choices like this. So for example, if you have two gadgets, uh, h square and the gadget h to the fifth, and you have two colorings, um, a coloring a of the first gadget and a coloring b of the second gadget, then you can enforce that, for example, uh, the color a on xy is always the same as the color of B on XY, XXY, for example. 
And the way you can enforce this is just by identifying those vertices. So you just identify the vertex xy from the first gadget with the vertex xy xxy from the second gadget. And what this gives you is that uh, if A is a projection and B is a projection, so for example, uh, if B is a projection to the last coordinate, so B always outputs Y, then that means that A must also always output Y. So that means that if, if for this gadget we chose a projection to the fifth coordinate, then we enforced this way that uh, uh, here we must project to the second coordinate. Um, so we can do this more generally. We can have any function pi from 1 to 5 uh, into 1, 2, for example. And for any such function, we can encode the constraint that if the second gadget is colored with pi, the projection pi, then the first is colored with the projection p pi of i for any function pi. So this is uh, with those kinds of gadgets and, and gluing those gadgets. Um, so if you think in, in terms of category, this is the kind of like taking the Collimate of a certain diagram. So just taking products of, of H and, and gluing those products. We can encode uh, any number of variables we, we want, variables of this kind that uh, we have to choose an integer between 1 and n. And with this gluing, we can encode any constraint that if we choose i here, then we must choose pi of i uh, there for any function pi. Okay, so this way we can encode a very general problem. We have uh, uh, variables that take any number of, uh, of choices and, and we have really kind of any, any constraints that the, any function pi as a constraint. So it's a very general problem and because of that, this problem is hard uh, even to approximate. So, so that, that's the main idea of why, why H coloring is, is hard. Okay, so to so in general, the problem with this is that it's not really true that the only H colorings of H n are projections. So what we really want to do is we want to understand what are the possible colorings uh, of the gadget, what are the possible homomorphisms H n to the H, besides projections, they, there might be more. And then if there are more, then there are kind of some kind of noisy encoding uh, that we want to decode. We want to argue that we still can uh, see such a every such homomorphism as some kind of choice, um, some kind of information. So we want to understand those homomorphisms, and we want to understand what happens when you do this kind of uh, thing with a homomorphism. Okay, so so from we can now forget about all you know all the algorithmic motivations. All we really want to understand is what are the possible homomorphisms from H to D into H. And these are called polymorphisms of H. And we want to understand what happens when you do this kind of identification. So we call it a minor, um, we call it a minor of, of the function of this polymorphism F. Uh, so for, if you have such a function F, uh, a polymorphism F uh, of rarity N, and you have any function N from one to N to some other set, one to K, then you can always define this function f through pi, which to a tuple x1 to xk outputs x by 1 to x by n. So this is kind of uh, the general thing you can do. You can permit coordinates and you can identify some coordinates. So for example, from a function on two variables, f on xy, you can make the function on one coordinate, which just always outputs f of xx, kind of like the diagonal. So you have this operation in general for any function. And this is, this is an algebraic structure which we call a minion. And if you want to think about it abstractly, you can also define that a minion is just a functor from finite sets to sets. Uh, a functor, so, so it has to assign for every finite set or for every integer, if you prefer. Uh, we have some set of n polymorphisms. In this case, it's just a homomorphism from h n to n. So you have, for every n, you have such a set. And for every function from n to k, you have this transformation, which somehow transforms one polymorphism into another polymorphism. It transforms an n array polymorphism into a k array polymorphism. And, uh, and this transformation has to act naturally. So it has to, act, it has to uh, compose uh, like a functor should. 
So, so all we really want to understand is, is, is this kind of abstract um, algebraic structure. But really, really the idea is just to understand uh, those polymorphisms, homomorphisms from a power of h to h, and what happens when you permute the coordinates and when you identify some of the coordinates. So, so that's the mathematical object we want to understand. Um, and in particular, in the case of when we come from the problem of H coloring, what we want to, to understand is those polymorphisms of H. Um, actually, those polymorphisms have, have much more structure. The, the, it's known as a clone because you can compose uh, those functions together. But in the case we're interested in, uh, we only have polymorphisms. So we have two fixed graph, you have G versus H coloring, then the polymorphisms are homomorphisms from G to the N to H. And then you don't have any additional structure, you kind of only have uh, the structure I, I, I mentioned here. So you have just sets uh, for every N and you have some transformation between those sets. Um, okay, so, so this might be a bit abstract. So let's let's see concretely how we work with with uh, specifically this this case I wanted to discuss so uh, polymorphism from CK to C3 so we look at some long odd cycle CK but of fixed size K uh, always an odd integer K uh, and we want to look at polymorphisms uh, from CK to C3 so these are homomorphism from the nth power of CK into C3 and homomorphism into C3, if you remember, that's, that's just the same thing as, as free colorings. So we want to say something about this homomorphism when n is, is large, when it's much larger than k. So k is maybe large, but it's fixed. You can think of it as large, but a fixed constant. And n is always much, much larger. And then what I want to argue, I want to argue that every such homomorphism, uh, sorry, every such homomorphism always has to look like a function which only depends on a few inputs. So a projection, for example, only depends on one input. It just outputs that, that one input. Um, so here it won't quite be true that every polymorphism is, uh, is a projection. That won't be true. But something almost, almost as good will be true that um, it will only depend on a few inputs, except for some noise. So, so even that is not true. That there is some noise. You can always change a few of the colors. Uh, so that it depends on all the inputs, but uh, we we will show that in a way you can you can kind of smooth out this noise by looking at this function as a continuous function. So so that's where the interesting part comes in. Uh, we look at graphs as topological spaces, and we look at functions with homomorphism. We look at at them as continuous maps, and the way we do them is with uh, a construction which is called the box complex. So it's a construction that to every graph assigns, to every graph G, it assigns some topological space box of G. That's the box complex of G. Uh, it's some kind of simplicial complex. Um, if you know the hum complex, um, you can also define it um, as, as the hum complex of homomorphism from K2 into G. But um, like the exact construction is not that important. Uh, it's just some, some way to assign a topological space to every, uh, to every graph. And what it gives for odd cycles, it gives a circle. So here you have an example of uh, what it gives for C3. The box complex of C3 is, is this simplicial complex, which is homotopy equivalent to just uh, a circle. Uh, more generally, if you look at the complete graph on K vertices, KK, then the box complex of that, for example, the box complex of K4 looks like this. And this is homotopy equivalent to a sphere in two dimensions, a two dimensional sphere. And more generally, the, the complete graph in K vertices uh, will give rise to, to the sphere on K minus two dimensional sphere. Uh, and kind of the crucial property of this, of this construction of the box complex is that it preserves products. So, the box, prod, the box complex of the product of uh, CK times CK times CK, so CK to the N, the box complex of that will be just uh, the product of circles, right? Uh, so the box complex preserves products, and because of that, the box complex of a product of circles is the same as the product of cycles, which is the same as the 
nth dimensional torus. So if n is equal to, that's just the standard torus, the surface of a torus, uh, and for larger n is, is this uh, n dimensional torus. Um, this box complex, uh, it's a functor from the category of graphs to the category of uh, topological spaces. So what it means is just that uh, if you have a graph homomorphism, essentially, then uh, you get a continuous map from the box complex of this one to the box complex of this one. So this way we can see any, any homomorphism as some kind of continuous function. Okay, so uh, the problem we started with, the problem, algorithmic problem we started with is uh, CK coloring versus C3 coloring. Uh, so what we understand, we want to understand is those polymorphisms. So we want to understand homomorphism from CK to the N into C3. So from such a homomorphism, we get a continuous map from the n torus to the circle. And that's, uh, well, now that's a continuous infinite object, but it, it's, it's a very simple thing, n torus and, and the circle. It's, it's some of the simplest spaces you can think of. So these are quite easy to analyze. Um, oh, and here I have an image, right, of, of uh, what happens when you take the box complex of CK square. So you get this simplicial complex uh, which, as you see, is, is quite obviously a torus. Um, so just in, in case you're curious, the, the way we build the, comp the box complex in general is we duplicate every vertex. Uh, we look, like, take like the um, tensor product k4 times k2, for example, or um, the tensor product of the, G, of the graph g times k2. And you look at this graph you get as, as a simple shell complex, so it has vertices and edges. But also, whenever you see a square, whenever you see a cycle in four vertices, you glue a face to it, and you glue some higher dimensional faces to it. So that's how you construct the box complexes in general. And that's why when you take the box complex of K4, for example, you will get uh, a sphere. OK, so, uh, so box complex goes from graphs to topological spaces. And then when we want to analyze this polymorphism, we get a continuous map from an n to, an, to a circle, which should be much simpler to analyze. So how do we do it? analyze it? Um, well, maps, maps to the circle, uh, if you look at maps from a circle to another circle, then they essentially characterize by the winding number. So you can count how many times this map winds around the other map. Uh, this defines an integer and called the winding number. And uh, for example, you can say that you can prove that uh, two maps from a circle to a circle are homotopic if and only if they have the same winding number. Um, and if you have a torus uh, in n dimensions, then you can look at cycles inside that torus and at winding numbers of those cycles. So you have n cycles that kind of generate the torus, like for the two-root torus, you have a meridional cycle and, and the other, the longer cycle. Uh, and generally you have n cycles. And formally, you can just define the degree, the i-th degree of f as the degree of the function which the x uh, maps to f0, 0, 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, 0, 0. So just keep uh, all of the coordinates fixed and we only move around one of the coordinates in the torus. So that defines some circle and we look at the winding number of that circle. Okay, so from, from this polymorphism, this way we get n integers. And these integers um, have nice properties. They're, they're not just random integers for any function. They behave nicely with respect to, to this operation of dating king minus. So remember, we had this transformation. Uh, like if you have some function f on many inputs, you can make a function on two inputs just by, by this assignment. Like to x, y, you assign f of x, y, y, x, for example. Okay, so this way we get uh, a polymorphism on two inputs. Uh, and if you try to calculate the first degree here, uh, the degree of what happens when you circle around the first coordinate, then it's not hard to show that this is just the sum of the degrees uh, of those coordinates, which are x here. So going around um, all those coordinates at the same time, turns out to be the same as going around the, this coordinate first, then around this coordinate, and so on and so on. So, so we can define those degrees for every function, 
And those degrees add nicely that when I identify two coordinates, uh, then their degrees add up. Um, and this way we can prove that uh, actually those degrees have to be um, have to be bounded that there cannot be too many of them. And the reason is that uh, we started with a homomorphism. So we started with something combinatorial, something discrete on some map between two finite uh, uh, sets, uh, very finite things. So there's only finitely many maps that you can have of uh, with two inputs. Uh, if you look at uh, all those possible maps you can get, it's always some homomorphism from CK squared to C3. So there's at most uh, 3k squared, 3 uh, to the power k squared, any of them. And the point is that that doesn't depend on n. Uh, even if here the function f even has many, many inputs, if you look at all the possible ways you can get a function of two inputs, then there's only really a bounded number of them, uh, which is independent of n. So there's only a bounded number of them. So that means that the degree of the, this map also has to be bounded independent of n. And that means that um, there cannot be many non-zero degrees. Because if you had many non-zero degrees, then you have many positive degrees, for example. Then you could just um, put x where those positive degrees are. You could add them up, and then you would get a high degree. So, so this has to be bounded. So in particular, also the number of coordinates that get a non-zero degree has to be bounded. So this way, by looking at this very simple topological invariant, uh, we, can, we can detect that uh, some of the coordinates and some of the inputs are somehow distinguished, that only some of those inputs have non-zero degree. If you, if you calculate this degree, uh, you will see that only some of them uh, will be actually non-zero. So this is a way we decode the function f. Uh, it, it kind of encodes this choice of just a few coordinates out of this n. So it doesn't pick point exactly one coordinate, like, like a projection, but it's still good enough. It still gives a pretty precise information that it only picks a few coordinates out of this n. Um, right, and I actually have to show one more thing, one more thing, namely that, uh, well, not all of those degrees are zero. Uh, if, if all of those degrees are zero, I wouldn't get any information. That wouldn't, that wouldn't really be any choice. So I have to prove that the degree is non-zero. So the way we do this is we, we say that the box complex is not just a topological space, it's a topological space together with uh, an action of the group Z2. So there's a way to swap uh, vertices with each other. And it on, for, for a function for homomorphism, like here, it doesn't just give some continuous map, it actually gives a map that uh, respects those actions of Z2. So we call this an equivariant map that the antipode of f is the same as uh, f of the antipode. And if you look at uh, maps from a circle to a circle, like uh, if you look at the map from x to f of xxxx, that's, that's going to give you a map from a circle to a circle. Uh, if such a map is equivariant, so uh, f of minus x is the same as minus f of x, then it's known that such a map must have odd winding number, it must have odd degree. Uh, that's actually fairly easy to show. It must have odd degree. So in particular, it have, must have non-zero degree. Uh, so the total degree, so this is the sum of all the degrees, as we've seen. Um, the sum of all degrees has to be non-zero, so someone has non-zero degree. And on the other hand, we know that only a few uh, of the inputs have non-zero degree. So this gives you a, uh, given such a homomorphism, we find out that uh, somehow a few of those inputs are, are distinguished. A few, only a few of them have non-zero degree. And this is how we decode the function f. Uh, and again, this is, this is why, why the problem of CK versus C3 coloring is hard. Uh, from, from this, like the algorithmic part from, from then on is, is, is pretty standard. Uh, we use this uh, as a gadget to encode a choice. And we showed that uh, even though this choice is a little bit fuzzy, it's enough to, to prove that the problem is very hard. Right, so that's, that's the whole proof that uh, CK coloring versus C3 coloring is, is NP-hard. So to prove something about algorithmics, to prove like half of this conjecture, um, uh, this Brackensic-Gurus-Fermi conjecture, we, used, uh, we just 
looked at the graph as a topological space. We looked at the function, this polymorphism, uh, sorry. We looked at it at, uh, as a continuous map and we used some very basic uh, topological uh, definition, the winding number, to, to show that a few inputs are distinguished. So that's like the, the, the whole idea. I think it's, it's quite surprising that it works that well. But I think it's even more surprising is that we can kind of show that um, um, in some sense, you have to go this way. In some sense, uh, the complexity of the problem we started with, so the complexity of, of uh, CK coloring to C3 coloring, uh, it only depends on the topology of C3, which here is a circle. In general, it might be another of the space. Uh, so you might ask what happens if you want to push this further, uh, if, we, um, if you want to prove um, hardness for four colorings, for example, um, how, how does this method extend? Well, what changes is that instead of C3, he would have the K4, the complete graph on four vertices or more vertices. And as I said, the space, the topological space that corresponds to this is, um, is uh, the sphere on K minus two dimensions. So you just get spheres and, and higher dimensions. So what we need to understand uh, is continuous maps from a torus in N dimensions to a sphere, like a two dimensional sphere. And the problem is we, well, we don't understand those, those maps enough. We, didn't, we don't know about topology. Uh, we're not topologists, so we don't know how to analyze those maps well enough, really. Um, and we don't really know how to, how to do that. Um, so I just, uh, so that's like how we proved uh, this first result. I want to quickly say uh, just a few things about the second, uh, how we proved the second uh, result. Uh, we look at uh, fin functors. So, so what is a fin functor? A fun fin functor, I mean, just a function from graphs to graphs uh, with such that uh, if there was a homomorphism from G to H, then after applying this, this function, there still is a homomorphism from lambda G to lambda H. So here, it's not the same as a functor. A functor has more conditions that um, some compositions have to, have to agree. Here, I just want, I just care about the existence of homomorphism. I don't care which homomorphism is which, I just care about the, about the existence of homomorphism. And that's why we call what, what, what I call a, a fin functor. Uh, and an example of a fin functor is lambda k. It's an operation that uh, every edge, uh, it replaces this with a path on k edges, right? So that's a ex very simple example of a functor. It's easy to show that it's, it's a fin functor. It, it, it is actually a functor in the category of graphs, but that won't be important. Uh, another example is gamma k, which puts an edge between endpoints of every k walk. So you look at every possible, so for every vertex, you look at every possible vertex you can reach by making exactly k steps, uh, exactly three steps, for example, and you connect that button a, by an edge. That's gamma k. So that's two examples of, of graph construction of fin functors. Uh, and those two functors have a property uh, called a jointness or finite jointness, really, uh, namely that uh, lambda g has a homomorphism to h if and only if g has a homomorphism gamma h. Again, that's that's uh, less strict than an actual adjointness. Uh, it's just saying that uh, this exists if and only if this homomorphism exists. We only care about the existence of homomorphism. And uh, adjoint functors uh, are interesting for us because they give a reduction between these problems. Um, so uh, th there's this notion of reduction in, in algorithmics that, if, that allows to show that if one problem is hard, then the other is hard. Uh, and it turns out that adjointness is exactly what we need uh, to, to prove reductions between, between those two problems, between that um, if gamma versus gamma, G versus gamma H is hard, then uh, the adjointness implies that lambda G versus H coloring is empty hard. So, so again, it comes from algorithmics. The motivations come from algorithmics, but, but it's, it's a purely mathematical uh, definition. We, we just want to understand when it's possible to have this kind of correspondence. And I just wanted to mention um, one such example, uh, but a very intriguing example, namely that as I said, uh, lambda k has this adjoint gamma k. So this lambda k, this construction that replaces an edge with a path 
as the subjoint gamma k, which kind of thickens the graph. Um, but it turns out that gamma k also has an adjoint uh, from the other side, omega k. So this omega k is, is another graph construction, which always says puts a finite graph. Um, it, it, the definition is a bit complex, but it's already surprising that just there is such a, such a, such a construction. And it proved to be useful in, in, in quite a few contexts. For example, in inherent Niemi's conjecture, um, with, I, th I think there was a talk about it on two weeks ago. So, so this functor omega k proved to be useful uh, in analyzing that conjecture, for example. Um, so, so that's already surprising that this functor exists. Uh, but another very surprising uh, uh, feature is that uh, omega k on G, uh, so it's a graph construction. When you look at the corresponding topological space at the box complex of G, it turns out that it behaves a lot like like very eccentric subdivision. So it kind of, if you think of uh, box of G as a kind of triangulated space, then it refines that triangulation. And what that means is that you can do um, what's known as a simplicial approximation. So if you have any con continuous map from the space of G to the space of H, any continuous map, it can be the very, very distorted continuous map. Uh, it doesn't have to be finite in any way. If you have any continuous map, then it turns out it's always homotopic to a map, uh, which is uh, which comes from a graph homomorphism. So which comes from something uh, very discrete, a graph homomorphism uh, between G and H. You on the only thing is that you have to apply this functor on a a few times, like for k k large enough, and with those properties, um, uh, it turns out to be quite easy to show that uh, only the topology of the graph matters. So for this problem as I'm studying, for, for this property of H, that G versus H coloring is hard for all G. Uh, if you have a, a graph H which satisfies this property and you have a graph H prime, which has the same topology, uh, so it's like a homotopy equivalent or, or really it's just that it has to admit uh, the same um, equivalent maps. So if you have two graphs whose topological spaces are equivalent in this sense, then it turns out that uh, H prime also has this property that G versus H prime uh, coloring is hard for G. So uh, I think it's quite surprising uh, that that uh, those topology comes comes in this way in, in those very algorithmic, very combinatorial problems. And in the end, I just wanted to mention some um, open problems, really vast directions in which to look at. Uh, maybe, maybe before I mention this one, I want to say there's there's not much we know about those adjoint functors. Um, we, it would be really nice to, to, to know more examples of, of those thin agent functors, like when, when we have triples of agent functors, because uh, there's, there's not many examples we know of, and all of the examples we know of turned out to be amazingly, uh, amazingly useful in, in other problems. So studying just, just uh, what agent functors are possible, that, that's, that's, I think, a, an interesting question uh, in pure graph theory. Mm. Another question I wanted to mention is that, uh, well, if you know the definition, the actual definition of adjointness in category theory, not just thin adjoint, but, but the actual adjointness, it, it's, it's something stronger, it has more conditions, it, uh, it, it has to be natural in some way. Um, and it turns out that if you have real adjoint uh, graph constructions, then this implies a relation between, between these polymorphism minions. So I, so I mentioned those abstract algebraic structures and, uh, in the middle of my talk, and it turns out, uh, well, there's this notion of uh, homomorphism between them. If you think them about them as set functors, it's just a natural transformation. And it turns out that if you have real adjoints uh, like lambda k and gamma k, these turn out to be actual adjoints in the category of graphs, then you have this relation between, between these minions, between these polymorphism minions. And then from this, uh, a reduction, an algorithmic reduction immediately follows. But for the interesting uh, adjoints for this omega k, for example, we know they're not really adjoint. They are only thin adjoints. And this means that they have to change the, the minion uh, in some interesting way. So they have to modify 
uh, this algebraic structure in some, some interesting way, but there still is a reduction. So it's, it would be really interesting to understand how it, how it transforms those algebraic structures, those minions. Uh, so and the second question, I, I already mentioned this, uh, the next step uh, from this topological direction would be to understand uh, maps from, from an Antorus to a sphere. Uh, so actually what we wanted to understand is equivalent maps, um, but if you don't know uh, much about equivalent topology, essentially what, what we want to understand is, is maps from the torus to the projective space, to the projective plane RP2. And finally, uh, when we go even further, that, that turns out there's, there's a major problem. If you look at uh, continuous maps from an torus to RP3, uh, or larger spheres, then it turns out that all of those, all of those maps, all of the um, maps will be homotopic. So there isn't any interesting information when you look at them just continuously. We can, it, it turns out that we lose all, all interesting information. But on the other hand, we proved that all of the information is contained in the box complex of K5. So it seems there's like a contradiction. It's not a, it's not a formal contradiction, but it's something that we clearly don't understand that uh, Somehow we, we have to look at topology, but when we do that in the in the obvious way by looking at, at uh, and continuous function induced by f, then it turns out we lose all interesting information. So that's something we we, we just don't understand. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thanks. Uh, so does anyone has any question? You can ask Marcin. Okay, so it seems like there are no doubts as such. So uh, thank you, Marcin, for this talk. It's really wonderful. Uh, let's all Sorry. unmute ourselves and uh, thank the speaker. Thank you. Yeah. So